Welcome to the Cast Blast Grill Chill Podcast with Jeremy and Trevor, the podcast that's all about hunting, fishing, grilling, and chilling out and having a good time in the outdoors. Jeremy here with Cast Blast Grill Chill. Quick intro for our podcast today. We have an interview with Dr. Billy Higginbotham going step-by-step step through warm season food plots for white-tailed deer. Before we get into the podcast, please take a moment and subscribe and leave us a review. It really helps us out and others find the podcast. Also, make sure you like our Facebook page and follow us on Instagram, Cast Blast Grill Chill, on just about all social media platforms. Thanks. Welcome to Cast Blast Grill Chill. Today we've got a special guest, Dr. Billy Higginbottom from AgriLife and Texas A&M University, along with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We're also joined by Josh Fulcher of East Texas Hunting Club, and we're going to talk spring and summer food plots today. Dr. Higginbottom, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for coming on. So, could you go ahead and give us a quick rundown of what you do with AgriLife, Texas A&M, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? Okay, well, my affiliation is with the Texas A&M University system. I did officially retire last August after 37 years with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, And in that role, I served as professor and extension wildlife and fishery specialist and also uh, a professor affiliated with the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries Sciences there on the campus at Texas A&M. Um, I was given emeritus status upon retirement, so I'm still quite active, uh, still work a good bit with landowners and uh, communications uh, through magazine articles and, and like uh, our, our podcast tonight. So still quite active, uh, been working uh, primarily with landowners on educational programming and managing their wildlife and fisheries resources, pretty much in the in the eastern one third of Texas. Although I've spent time just about uh, in all areas of the state, most of my career has been spent in the eastern third of the state, and so uh, a lot of that time has been spent working on and developing food plot strategies for white-tailed deer, and then also managing private waters for uh, for fisheries, recreational fisheries. So that's been the bulk of my time. Uh, and then when the wild pigs showed up in the in the late 70s, early 80s, I, I spent a good bit of time working on techniques to help uh, landowners mitigate the damage that wild pigs have caused and continue to cause to this day uh, on that private property. Well, it sounds like you've been a busy man even post-retirement. Well, you know, as long as we've got ponds and we've got deer and we've got wild pigs, I'll still be in business. Yes, sir. It sounds that way. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about food plots in general, but specifically spring and summer food plots. Uh, You've got some excellent PDFs that you sent me regarding this that we're going to make available to our listeners. What are some of the advantages of spring and summer food plots for deer? Well, it's, I've been fortunate in my career because uh, I actually did my Ph.D. dissertation research on supplemental forages for white-tailed deer. And so uh, I've had the opportunity to use our facilities there at the Texas A&M Research and Extension Center at Overton uh, to study these forages for well over 30 years now. So we've we've had a lot of opportunity to look at different plantings and uh, sort through uh, the hype and, and come up with what I feel like some, some pretty solid recommendations for landowners and uh, the, I guess the one thing that I would emphasize uh, to the listeners is this, and that is one test is worth a thousand expert opinions. You know, you're going to see a lot of different sacks of feed or, or seed that uh, have a big buck picture on the front and this, that, and the other, and and this one's the best and that one's the best, but don't be afraid to experiment, but don't plant your whole strategy of plots in anything until you see the results for yourself. So I always emphasize one test is worth a thousand expert opinions, so uh, do it yourself, see what the results are, and don't always believe the hype. Uh, and there's plenty of hype out there. Let me tell you, the, when the snake oil salesman ran out of snake oil, they switched over to seeds to plant for white-tailed deer. And so uh, it's pretty hard to live up to the hype in some cases, but uh, landowners shouldn't be afraid, and hunters, hunting clubs shouldn't be afraid to experiment. But just put in plots next to something that you know already works, and do a side-by-side comparison, and uh, seeing is believing. So I want to emphasize that. Now, warm season plots in particular, there's some 
it's very uh, evident differences compared to cool season strategies. First, let me say this. There is no planning that I know of that, that you plant, and it's going to take care of your deer herd 12 months out of the year. Uh, we're looking at a warm season planting in the spring and a cool season planting in the fall. There are certain plants that can be available pretty much 12 months out of the year, but we haven't got it refined down to where it's a one forage fits all throughout a 12-month growing season. But in our warm season forages, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to concentrate the deer for harvest. Obviously, we're trying to meet the nutritional needs of the whitetails uh, during the growing season, the warm months. And we have a pretty severe stress period in late summer in our part of the state. You know, you get into that July-August time period, and a lot of the native forage becomes lacking in both abundance and quality. And by quality, I mean crude protein and some other measurements that we, we use to determine how good that forage is for a particular species of wildlife. So what we're trying to do with our warm season forages planted in the spring is to fill in the gaps uh, for that warm season stress period. Let's just say typically the last half of July, maybe through the first week or two of September until those fall rains get started. Now, sometimes, obviously, that stress period can be elongated, and then sometimes it can be reduced just depending on how our, our rainfall patterns go. But we're not trying to replace the whitetail deer's native diet, the forbs, the browse that's out there uh, in the fall, the mast that's out there. What we're trying to do is ease the impact of those stress periods. And, of course, warm season's going to be in that time period I just described. Cool season's basically going to be about the time general gun season closes, January, February, up to mid-March when we get spring green up. So we're not trying to replace their diet. We're trying to supplement and fill in and help them over the hump during those those two major stress periods. So we're typically looking, let's just call it uh, in a 35-inch rainfall belt, uh, which is going to take in roughly I-35 east down to I-45, down towards Houston, and then back up above that. That's That's kind of a rough delineation, but certainly anywhere where you've got 30, 35 inches of annual rainfall, uh, you're going to be a candidate for being able to use these warm season forages. So the first thing that uh, I want to emphasize is that we want to look at fewer, larger plots when we plant our warm season forages. And so when we do that, we don't want to plant the exact same ground where we're going to establish our cool season plots. They can be adjacent to each other. But what you want to do is move out a little more into the open, maybe away from cover, would be okay because the deer hopefully are not being hunted during the warm season uh, in the <laughs> summer months. And so it's okay to, to plant adjacent to where you uh, typically establish your cool season plots. Just don't plant on, on the same exact ground because what you'll find yourself doing is having to go in and shred and, and disc under your summer forages kind of at the end of that stress period in late August, early September to prep that ground for your fall planting. So it's best to segregate those two plantings to where they're not going to be on top of each other. But the strategy should be fewer, larger plots in the summer and more numerous small plots if we're going to hunt over them in the winter. And so that's one uh, very important difference that we need to make between the two. The other thing that is uh, uh, very different between warm season versus cool season is the amount of uh, competition that we've got. When you go in there and tickle this ground with a disc or other techniques that you're going to use to prepare that site to plant, there's a lot of seeds in that, in that soil bank, and you're going to create a lot of weed seed germination uh, when you go in there and start disking in the spring to plant. And so you have got to be able to plant varieties that can compete well with that native vegetation that's going to uh, compete for sunlight and moisture and nutrients. And so that's, uh, that's one thing that we have to look at. But uh, those are some, some differences between the two. Larger, uh, um, fewer larger plots to spread out the browsing pressure, and then uh, 
looking at trying to plant varieties that can compete uh, with weeds for the, the nutrients, sunlight, and water. Okay, and uh, do other species besides deer benefit from these food plots? Absolutely, uh, but perhaps not in the way that you might commonly think. <laughs> While you may have some species benefit from seed production, for example, maybe turkeys uh, feeding on cow pig seed uh, and, and uh, things like that, but in many cases it's the insect populations that develop as a result of that crop that you've planted. And uh, whether it be quail or whether it be turkey poults, those young need an insect-rich diet, a high-protein diet. And so oftentimes it's the insect population that uh, develops around that crop that is so beneficial to many other species rather than just foraging on the plant itself. Well, that's really good to hear that it helps out turkeys and other things too besides just helping the deer through those stress periods and helping those young turkey poults get through those first critical weeks of life. By creating that diversity, by putting something that wasn't there and providing a different kind of a habitat type is, is going to benefit a lot of non-game species as well as game species. So what are you looking for in site selection when it comes to getting your food plot ready in the spring? Are you looking for something that's going to stay kind of moist and shaded in the summer with this, you know, as hot as Texas heat can be? you know, in July and August? Well, if I have my choice, of course, moisture is going to be limiting in the summer months. It always is. And, uh, you know, this, this last summer was a fantastic uh, summer. We got rains along and kept our forages going, and so uh, we produced a lot of forage for those, those folks that did put in warm season plots, did very well. I prefer sites that are more bottomland-type sites that, are, that hold moisture a little more. Uh, maybe have a little more higher moisture content, but those sites cannot be susceptible to flooding. If we get those sites flooded out, we'll lose our crop. So if you can find some <clears throat> more bottomland sites that are not going to be subject to late spring and summer flooding, uh, I prefer those sites typically other as compared to kind of upland droughty deep sand sites, for example, that are going to dry out a lot quicker. So I, I think if you've got the, that option of being able to plant some larger plots in more bottomland type areas, that's going to be one thing I'm going to look for uh, right off the bat. Now, in a normal rainfall year, you may be able to plant and do well on some of these upland sites, but they are going to dry out a little quicker if we get into a period of going 30 days or so without rain, as often the case in our part of the world, in, uh, in especially July and August. But uh, uh, we will plant upland sites, but I, I certainly look for those bottomland sites that have a little higher moisture retention capability uh, first. All right. So once you've... Once you've... Go ahead, Josh. I just, I just wanted to go back. Yeah, I just wanted to go back uh, just, to, just a touch. Uh, Dr. Higginbottom, <clears throat> you were talking a while ago... Um, you said, you know, in the summertime, we want those fewer, larger plots to get into the, the winter, fall season. You know, then we'll start getting into this, uh, more smaller plots. Um, can you elaborate a little bit whenever you say larger sure. or smaller? What, what's the differentiation between what do you consider a larger plot versus a smaller plot? Well, <clears throat> that's a really good point. I'm, first of all, I'm going to advocate that you plant a minimum of 2% of your habitat in warm season plots and 1% in cool season plots. That's a minimum. So that means two out of every 100 acres that you've got in, in deer habitat need to be in warm season plots, and one acre out of 100 need to be in cool season plots. That's how important I think warm season plots are because what you're trying to do is give those deer high-quality nutrition during those summer months because you've got several things going on. You've got those does that hopefully produce twin fawns, and you want them to be able to produce enough milk to carry those twin fawns through the summer and the fall and be recruited into the deer population. You've got those fawns in late summer trying to put on enough weight gain uh, to w when they switch off of that milk diet and, and get on a forage diet. You need high-quality forage for them to get their weight gain so they can be recruited and live through the winter. And then you've got those bucks out there growing those bones on top of their head that keep all the taxidermists in business. And so all of those things benefit, all those uh, 
conditions benefit from that high quality forage diet. Now, in the summer, when you start putting in warm season food plots, your food plots are going to be the best game in town in terms of abundant quality forage. And so you're going to just have a siphoning effect of deer around you coming in because of that high quality forage compared to what else is available. Now, the better habitat management a landowner does, let's say they're in there and they're doing prescribed burning and they're rotating their cattle, they're not letting the cattle just go in and overgraze and uh, doing some things like that, maybe doing some timber stand improvement by thinning some timber, removing some undesirable uh, species. The more habitat management you do, the less the deer will rely on those food plots. It's just common sense. Uh, the poorer your habitat condition, the more they're going to rely on those food plots. So it's not unusual for these warm season plots, the deer to stack in on those things. And if you start trying to plant two acre, three acre, five acre plots, they can go in once the, we get into our summer weather pattern and uh, native forage is lacking in quality and or abundance, and they can get on those plots and hammer them. And if they hit them hard enough, early enough, you can lose your entire stand. You may get ample rainfall, but uh, if they clip them off at a two-leaf stage, say in the case of cowpeas, they won't be able to come back. So by planting those larger plots, you're spreading that browsing pressure that you're surely going to get because of that high-quality abundant forage and spread it out so those plants can continue to leaf back out. So when you say how much, I'll answer that like this. One 10-acre plot is better than two 5-acre plots, and one 5-acre plot is better than two 2.5-acre two plots. So I realize that a lot of times in our part of the state, you don't have a lot of open ground that you can work with, especially if you're in the piney woods, for example. But the larger plots that you can put in, the deer will find it. And, of course, they'll, they'll move further away from cover to feed, during the summer months because there's, there's not a hunting season and somebody's not shooting an arrow or a bullet at them during that time. So that's the main reason. Uh, the cool season plots, smaller plots, lots of edge. You want those deer to be in there and, and use those plots during hunting season, during daylight hours, uh, to where you know they can be used as a harvest aid. So that's a valid use of cool season plots, but it's not the only use of those cool season plots, as I said earlier, that second stress period, January, February, and early March, we want to take care of those deer nutritional needs then as well during that stress period. So that's the reason for fewer larger versus more numerous smaller plots between the two planting cycles. It makes 100% sense to me. All righty, Billy, so you've got your site selected. Soil testing, how important is it? And, well, and it's, ab it's a, go ahead. And you know, how do you go about getting it done? Um, I'm going to provide the link to the AgriLife extensions. The county. Okay. Here is the it's https uh, colon slash slash counties dot agrilife dot org, and that I know gives you a link of all your AgriLife county extension agents. Right. And I know that they do do soil testing there. Am I correct in that? Well, you've got two opportunities for soils labs here in, in our part of the state. You can uh, go through Texas A&M, and they'll send the sample, or you can send the sample down to the soils lab. But Stephen F. Austin there in Nacogdoches also has a soils lab. And so you've got a couple of choices. Now, the county agents that you mentioned will all have the soil bags so that you take your sample. But, but let me go into a little detail on how you need to take that sample. And, of course, the, the link that you're offering will go into this. Let's say that you've got a 10-acre plot that you're going to prepare and try to plant in May. Okay, here we are in March. What I would do is I'd take a sharpshooter, and I'd go around, and I'd take <clears throat> about 8 to 10 samples about 6 inches deep, just little thin slices. Think of uh, maybe a sandwich size, okay, about the size of a couple slices of bread, <clears throat> excuse me, down about 6 inches. Take a five-gallon bucket, put that sample in there, and skip around and take your samples from that 10-acre plot and then mix them up by hand and pour them into that bag. That bag probably going to be a little smaller than a quart size, and but you're going to take that composite sample. Now, that's going to be free of the, the top weed growth and all of that. You want to scrape everything clear down to the ground when you take that sample. 
<clears throat> if you've got bottomland sites versus upland sites that you're going to plant, you need to treat those differently and, and pull samples separately for each of those using that same technique and send them in separately because you may have various different things going on there. And there are several things that we're looking for with our, with our soil test. Over here in East Texas, uh, as you get further and further east of I-35 and certainly across the Trinity River, you're going to start hitting acid soils. And acid soils can limit forage production depending on the species that you're planting. Uh, we can have soils that get down, uh, you know, in, in the low fives pretty, pretty commonly uh, over here in East Texas. And uh, if we don't amend that soil properly uh, and get that pH adjusted to where it's at least somewhat closer to neutral with seven being neutral, then uh, we're just not going to get the bang for our buck out of any forage that you put out there. And this is specifically true if we're trying to go in and plant clovers. Clovers are more pH sensitive than, say, some of the cereal grains. But the fact is, if you've got a pH 5 and you're trying to grow cereal grains there, you're not going to get the production that you would get if you were able to adjust that pH up to 6, 6.5 through ag lime application. Okay. So... Uh, but once you get your soil samples um, and you get the bag, so you can either send them off to A&M or to Stephen F. Austin, you said, and then they'll give you a report back on exactly what your soil levels are, nutrient-wise, uh, acidity-wise, and all that. And then will they also give you recommendations on how to amend your soil? Yes, they will. They'll come back if you need lime. And again, as you get into the more neutral soils towards the black land, as you get over, uh, you know, west of the Trinity River, headed towards I-35, pH isn't going to be a big problem. You're not going to have to uh, lime a lot of those soils over there. But again, you'll get that back. But uh, the the uh, the lime recommendations will come back uh, to you on a so many ton per acre basis. And let's say that report gives you a uh, recommendation of uh, two tons of lime to the acre. When you go to your farm supplier to, to buy your lime, they're going to have an ECCE rating, and uh, that's going to be effective calcium carbonate equivalents that will rate how close that lime is to being 100%. Now, if you can buy lime that was a, had an ECCE rating of 100%, and they were recommended two tons to the acre, then you would put two tons to the acre out there. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of our liming materials that we have available to use are going to have an ECCE rating of 50%, 70%, just depends. You need to ask that question as a landowner or as a hunting club so you know. Let's just pick an easy example. If, uh, if you get a recommendation from the soil lab that you need two tons per acre and your vendor has lime that has an ECCE of 50%, guess what? You need to put four tons out to get the equivalent of that two-ton recommendation. So it's very important to point. ask that question, uh, and, and it varies. Now, part of why it varies is not the liming material source it is how finely that lime is ground you know you can get some pretty good sized clumps of lime if it's not ground very finely or you can buy some that is very finely ground and obviously as you incorporate that lime into the ground through disking and preparing that food plot you're going to get a quicker reaction from a finer grind lime than you will a coarser grind lime it's still going to take a while to get the full benefit. You can't lime today and get results tomorrow. But if someone's looking at going in and putting that warm season plot in in May, which is my recommendation, then here in March, it's perfectly fine to go in, treat that vegetation to kill it that's growing there now, or shred it and get it off of there. And uh, if, if a lime recommendation, you get that soil sample back within a uh, results back within a week or so, and you need lime, you can go ahead and incorporate that lime now and disc it in and let it start doing its job. You won't get the full benefit by May, but you'll certainly be off on the right foot. 
Dr. Billy, while we're talking about Lyme, um, there's obviously multiple choices out there for Lyme. Uh, what's your thoughts on uh, agricultural Lyme versus pelletized Lyme versus liquid Lyme? Well, you know, kind of the way that you've listed them there is going to be most inexpensive to most expensive in that and in, in along that line with with the bulk lime uh ag lime being the most economical and uh you know calcium carbonate's calcium carbonate you're getting it out there and uh it's just a matter of of uh you know ease of uh, application and uh the the expense involved uh but with by, with the liquid lime um with the liquid lime would you see the effects of the liquid lime sooner than you would say with the agricultural lime or the pelletized lime because it's liquid and it's getting into the soil. Well, I think just common sense tells you yes. The answer to that is uh, absolutely you would. But you know, is it worth the extra expense to go that route versus going uh, uh, what with what's most available? But uh, you know, you're you're paying a pretty good premium for liquid lime. It's a combination of very fine lime in water with a little bit of clay to form a suspension. And uh, it's going to be more expensive per ton of material applied due to the increased cost for the finely ground materials, freight, and then having, you know, the equipment to apply it. Uh, I got no problem with just using the bulk lime that our, our farmers and ranchers use on their cattle pastures and hay meadows, that sort of thing. That's going to be the easiest to get your hands on. There will be more of that out there at different points of uh supply that require you having to haul at shorter distances to get it to your hunting property. And so I, I've got no problem with using the typical line that's out there. Now, you can make a decision to use perhaps a more finely ground product that's got a higher ECCE. And if, if you were going to spend a little bit more money, uh, you're going to get a quicker reaction from that. And that's where I would tend to spend my money if you have that choice of, say, buying a 70% product versus a 50% product. And uh, by incorporating it into that soil, getting it dished into that top five, six inches, uh, you're going to get a little more bang for your buck that way. Great advice, Billy. Question for you for when it comes to seed selection for your for your spring-summer food plots. What should you be planting? Well, and I'm basing this off of, like I say, over 30 years of research. The gold standard for warm-season forages for deer in our part of the state is going to be forage cowpeas. Now, I'm not suggesting you don't look at some of the others. You hear a lot about Lab Lab uh, down in South Texas. Dr. Ray Smith, Lagoon Breeder at the A&M Center at Overton, and I have worked together for a number of years, and he has, he has developed some lines of cowpeas, and he has developed some lines of Lab Lab that are, uh, you know, look pretty good but i still say after 30 years of, of planting these things iron and clay forage cowpeas is the one variety that i would start with and you compare everything else you want to plant to that but we can go in with that iron and clay cowpea we can inoculate that seed and we'll talk about that in a little more depth hopefully and go in on a good prepared seed bed at 50 pounds to the acre, and that's broadcast, not drilled. See, when I did all this original research, I wanted to plant these uh, forages the same way with the same equipment that hunting clubs had available to them. Now, we've got all the fancy seed drills and so forth <clears throat> at the A&M Center, and I could have used those, but then you may not get the same results that I got because I was using specialized equipment. So I used whatever hunting club and has got out there, and that is a tractor with a shredder and a disc and some sort of way, and it could be an old chain link fence or it could be a bunch of tires tied together for a drag. And so that's the equipment that I used because I wanted everybody else to be able to get the same results that I got. So uh, that's the gold standard to me. <clears throat> but I think you need to go in there and you need to either shred that area down or you need to spray it and let the herbicide do its work. And then once it's killed it, go in, shred it, and then disc that material in, get a good firm seed bed disc up, and then drag it to where it's fairly level. 
because one of the biggest problems that we have is planting seed too deep. And the rule of thumb is the bigger the seed, the deeper you can plant it. But the biggest seed out there, uh, let's say, <clears throat> again, cowpea is about the biggest one you'll run into for warm season planting. It only needs to go an inch deep. And so it's very easy to get carried away if you're going to try to dish seed in rather than drag it in to cover that cowpea seed or anything that's large like that, three, four, five inches deep, and that's too deep. So if you can go back and level that food plot uh, after you've got it disked up and got a good smooth seed bed, uh, that's going to help you get that seed at a more appropriate depth when you get ready to go back over it. And you can lightly dish seed in if you're careful. But uh, I almost prefer dragging it because you're getting more trouble covering seed with too little soil or too much soil than you will too little soil. Now, when you get into some of these finer seeds, uh, the clover seeds, and you know, Alice clover, joint vetch, some of the things like that that have been planted, these are very tiny seeds, and you just need to drag them in. So you, if you're planting a combination of, say, cow peas and joint vetch, just to pick a couple, you're going to want to put your cow peas down first and get them incorporated in, and then you're going to want to put out that joint veg seed, which is tiny, and just barely rake it in so it's not covered to the same depth as cow peas. So uh, as you see in some of the materials I sent you, planting seed too deep is, uh, is a big sin that we commit, whether it's warm or cool season uh, food plots. But work that seed bed up, spray it if necessary, shred it, disc it, get a good seed bed, then try to drag something over to level it up to where you can get that seed in at the appropriate depth and then plant that seed at the appropriate depth. And like I say, the biggest seed out there shouldn't be more than an inch below the surface. Yes, sir. That makes a lot of sense. And one of the... You, go you ahead, Josh. I into it a little bit. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I, while we were here, I wanted to, wanted to make sure we get this point hammered in because I've seen this across the East Texas Hunting Club Facebook page quite a bit. Um, you know, there's several seed manufacturers and companies out there that have, um, you know, a bunch of uh, publicity and publication out there, these throw-and-go type seeds. Um, it's still the importance of seed-to-soil contact has still got to be um, pretty high up there, even with these smaller these smaller seeds. If you, if you don't get them in, uh, if you don't get these seeds buried into the ground, even, you know, just a, an inch or two, uh, the likelihood of them taking off is is still uh, pretty minute. Am I correct on that? Well, uh, in general, yes. I mean, there's been some work done, no tilling to to minimize the impact. Uh, and certainly, you know, seed drills can help you put some seed in without doing quite as uh, as extensive um, soil prep. But you still got to do some. And so, yes, uh, you know, you, you got to have that soil to seed contact that you've described, and uh, that that all speaks to this this soil prep that that we've talked about of you know perhaps using a herbicide if needed but certainly shredding down low disking getting that seed bed you know getting a good clean seed bed uh we've tried to plant into some pretty dirty seed beds where we had a lot of weed growth on there and a lot of uh just organic matter that didn't get disk in good and and you'll get some pretty spotty stands in a lot of cases uh when you plant into something like that Right. Yeah, I was just I just wanted to make that point, um, you know, and have actually you make that point for us uh, to where, you know, a lot of guys have noticed over the last couple of seasons are, um, you know, talking about, well, I'll just throw out, you know, take out some of this throw and grow and, and throw it out there and it'll be fine with no preparation work done. No, yeah, like, you're not. You, this you, lush you, food plot. Right. Well, here's the reason why it hasn't worked out for you. So. And the other thing to do in the warm season, uh, you know, we talked about you can move out away from cover, but let's say you, you, you kind of want to plant adjacent cover, no problem with that. Uh, but get outside the drip line of the trees and watch your shading because uh, we want to uh, have plots that get pretty full sunlight. I get a lot of questions about, well, you know, what can go in the shade? Well, not much. And so, uh, you know, if you're in a hardwood stand, obviously in the winter you're going to lose leaves and you're going to get more sunlight on the ground in a kind of a closed canopy situation. If it's pines, not happening. They're going to continue to have their needles and you're going to get shading. So pay attention on your warm season plots. Move outside the drip line of the trees. If you want to plant adjacent to cover, that's fine. But, but get outside that drip line and plant where you've got full sunlight. And when do you... 
And when do you recommend that we plant our spring summer food plots? I would like to go in somewhere between the 1st and 15th of May. And again, I'm, I'm going to suggest if, if no one's ever planted warm season food plots for deer, start with iron and clay cowpeas. Now, I keep talking about that variety. I looked in my research at about four different forage cowpea varieties. And the reason we talk about forage cowpeas is, yes, they're going to make a seed. But the the emphasis, the genetics of those particular forage cowpeas is they're going to produce more leaf than they are seed. So we're not really worried about producing a seed pod. We're more uh, interested in producing a lot of leaf, which is what the deer are going to use primarily. Uh, and so uh, we're going to want to plant those. And uh, if you back up into April, you can get into too cool of soil temperatures to get good germination. A lot of people say, well, I've got the soil moisture, I want to plant now. Well, you can plant too early. And so I like to wait until that window of 1st uh, to 15th of May. If it's real dry and you have to wait, you know, we've planted as late as mid-June if we have to. I don't prefer that. But what we have seen is if you've got to have those deer pretty much stay off of those peas for the first six weeks, till they get out of that two-leaf stage. If they go in and browse them at a two-leaf stage when they're about, I don't know, six to eight inches tall, and they clip them off, you're done. That plant can't produce more. But if you can if you can keep the deer off of them until uh, we get past that, then as they're browsed down, you get a little shower. They'll put out more leaf growth, which is what you want. So how do you keep the deer off of them? Well, hopefully in May we're still getting... Uh, spring rains and our native brows, our native forbs, uh, are still in good enough shape that the deer are concentrating on them. And so you're, you're again, wanting your warm season forages to fill in the gaps during that stress period in late summer, not in June or not in May. You want them available. You, you would just soon the deer leave them alone for the first 60 days. And then once those peas get up, belt high. Uh, and you start getting some, some dry weather, go a couple of weeks without a rain, it gets hot, then all of a sudden those deer are going to start hitting them. But by then, if you've got belt-high cowpeas, you're looking at five 6,000 pounds of dry weight forage to the acre and 20-plus uh, percent crude protein, maybe approaching 30 earlier in the growing season. So uh, a lot of good forage. You start doing the math on on uh you know, five, 6,000 pounds of dry weight forage uh, pro uh, provided in the form of a food plot rather than a feeder. And you're talking about pretty inexpensive forage delivered to your deer uh, in such a way that you're not having to fill a feeder and do this and do that. Now, a lot of people are, are going to supplement deer to a feeder, and that's fine. But here in East Texas, where we've got 30, 35 inches of rainfall a year or more, up to 55 inches, you get down in that Beaumont country, uh, you've got to look at, at warm season forages because it's so economical to plant them versus trying to feed them any other way. And you can get a lot of bang for your buck and, and produce that forage for pennies on the uh, per pound by, by planting the right forages. And when you start getting up there, Five six thousand pounds of dry weight per forage. You've knocked the price per pound of forage produced down to, to very little. So you know when I when I rate forages, I look at four things. I look at number one: can we produce enough of it to justify establishment? I mean, there's some things we can plant that the deer love, but if we can't grow but five hundred pounds to the acre, that's probably not something we want to be looking at. And from an economical standpoint. I want a plant that I can grow at least a ton of dry weight forage to the acre. That's a bare minimum. I want something that the deer like to eat, obviously, but believe it or not, there are some things we can plant out there that do great, good good quality, abundant, but the deer don't like them. So, you know, it's got to be something the deer will eat. It's got to be something that's going to be around <clears throat> during that stress period. You know, and in this case with warm season forages uh, late summer, and it's got to meet the nutritional needs of the deer. It's got to be able to produce enough crude protein, for example, that uh, the deer will actually benefit from it. So those are the criteria I use to evaluate any forage. And first and foremost is, is going to be, okay, it's got to be something the deer like, and we've got to be able to grow enough of it to justify establishment costs. And so uh, 
Uh, I think iron and clay cowpeas, the, the varieties I looked at, that one produced more tonnage per acre. It uh, lasted a little longer than the other varieties I looked at, typically uh, into mid-September. Uh, and uh, it seemed to withstand browsing pressure a little bit better than some of the other forage cowpeas. And, uh, you know, we've planted a lot of different plants side by side with those. We've planted Lab Lab. We've planted soybeans, lots of different summer forages. And I don't dissuade, try to dissuade anyone from experimenting with some of the others. But by golly, plant them side by side and see how they perform, see what the, the production is, see what the utilization is. And uh, if, you just, if you're curious, you can always send a forage sample off to one of those soil labs we talked about, and they can actually give you the, the nutritional data on that particular forage. Great advice, Billy. Um, and you mentioned disking your seabed. Um, how well would you recommend disking it? And, you know, exactly, you know, how well do you want to prepare that seabed before you go back and, and plant your cowpeas and, you know, whatever uh, supplemental besides your uh, iron and clay cowpeas you want to add to your plot? Well, if, it, if it's a dry spring and you don't have a lot of soil moisture, you can disk it too much. You keep turning that soil and exposing more and more of it to the drying effects of the sun and wind. And, you know, you can dry out those top few inches, and you don't really do that. But I want to be able to go in there and, and shred it well enough uh, and, and then disk it well enough with enough passes if necessary that I've got pretty much all, all soil showing, you know, and uh, I don't want to just pulverize the soil and break it down, but I want to have uh, most of the organic matter that's left uh, incorporated into the soil, which will help build that soil quality, you know, for next year, because that organic matter will decompose and help build that soil over time. And uh, so I, I want to go, you know, I have had to go multiple passes over it with a disc uh, in order to, to get that good seed bed worked up. But I, I want a lot of soil showing. Uh, and of course, you want good moisture in that soil when you get ready to put the seed in the ground come uh, hopefully the 1st to the 15th of May. Josh, you got anything you want to add to any of this? Yeah, I'm just following along, taking notes. Yes, sir. Same here. Billy, I got to say there you is are... There is something that I would encourage everyone to do, and that is uh, get you some uh, three or four uh, foot high poultry netting or uh, mesh fencing and build you some exclosures. Uh, you know, about a 10-foot a, a length will make you an ex exclosure about three feet in diameter and stake that down with a couple of t-posts on a couple of different spots on these plots and that all, all that all that does is protect a small area from browsing uh, so you can kind of compare the uh, the use of that uh, vegetation that particular forage by deer uh, late summer i've had just stands three and four feet high inside those enclosures and it's looked like you've taken a shredder around the rest of the plot to where the deer have just eaten it down almost to nothing. And it makes a pretty stark comparison. But what you can also do is you can get an idea of what your uh, your production is by uh, taking the forage that's, that's not available and, and drying that forage in an oven and uh, getting a dry weight on it. And then you can actually calculate you would want multiple samples to do it, but you can't actually calculate what your tonnage of production was on a per acre basis. That's exactly how we establish how many pounds of forage per acre we're producing. We uh, we take forage that's unavailable to the deer, uh, dry that down, and then uh, get a weight on it based on so many square feet of uh, that that stand was covering and relate that back to the 43,560 square feet in an acre and we can actually calculate that tonnage of production. So putting those exclosures out there, whether it's a warm or cool season plot, I think it's just a good visual of uh, how the hunters and hunting clubs can see utilization because it's not always as apparent if you don't have something to compare to. And, of course, the other thing you can do, even in the summer, is go out there and hang a few game cameras around on some of those plots. Uh, I guarantee you you're going to pull some deer uh, from other properties around you unless you've got a, just a very large parcel of land that you're controlling. 
because uh, it, it, the quality of that forage, if, if surrounding landowners or land holdings are not planting, the quality of those warm season forages are going to be very attractive to the deer, and you'll pull deer from pretty good distance. Great advice on the exclusions, sure. Billy. Um, in your paper, yeah, well, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, one one thing that we haven't touched on yet is um, you know. Once once you've got your food plot planted and you know everything's growing with all the rain that we get here in East Texas, um, I always hear about uh, keeping your food plots maintained and mowed down. Um, is there a specific time or a specific height with these forage cowpeas or um, you know any of these other perennials that we might choose to plant? Uh, is there a specific time or uh, a specific height at which we should uh, be out there mowing and, and keeping these things mowed down? Uh, uh, we don't on our on our plants like uh, lab lab soybeans cowpeas these larger seeded warm season plantings we don't ever mow those. You know, we you just want let them go. Make. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, the deer the deer will work on them when when they can't get what they need quality wise or abundance wise from the native diet that's out there. That's when they're going to switch over. To that food plot. Well, what about and so? Um, what about like clover and uh, clover and oats and? Typically, <clears throat> I do not mow any of those. Uh, occasionally, what we will do for a fall planting, if we've got say a cereal grain like oat and a clover planted together, once that uh, cereal grain starts getting rank after spring green up, say early April. Uh, we will run a, a mower set at a high height, you know, maybe uh, 15, 18 inches high if we can, over the top of it just to knock that stuff off where the clover can get sunlight if you're planting a combination of, uh, let's say, air leaf clover and small grain. Uh, I, I think that, that works very well. You could do the same thing if with a fall planting. Another good combination is a, just chicory and a small grain like oats. And uh, you could go in. See, once once spring green up hits, mid March most years, mid March to mid April. Uh, I don't care what you've got planted out there. Once spring green up hits, those deer can make a living back in the woods, and they're not going to touch your plot. That's when they're going to back off that small grain. It's going to get rank, and if you've got anything else planted with it that's a lower growing growth, like you mentioned the clovers, then yes, you can come in and and cut the top off of that stuff to get sunlight and uh, we're back down to that plant that's got a little lower growth form. The other time that we'll go in and mow is if you've got some of these perennials like air leaf clover, all you got to do is go in there uh, after they produce seed in July and August and shred that, uh, shred that plot and you're scattering that seed. After the first year of planting that air leaf clover, you may not ever have to go back and, and reseed again. You may have enough volunteer growth from that seed that you produced that it becomes almost a permanent component of that food plot. And that's, that's exactly the point that I was hoping you would make. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Let's back up just a second, guys. We talked about lime. Let me, let me touch on fertilization uh, because part of that soil lab report is going to be uh, what – you're going to fertilize with and uh, that's going to be specific to the crop that you're trying to grow and your soil chemistry uh, what frustrates me a lot is we'll get a soil result soil lab uh, result back on a plot and it gives us some blend of uh, and you'll get three numbers as, as you, everyone knows there's three numbers on a fertilizer bag nitrogen is the first number phosphorus is the second number potassium is the third number and let's let's just pick on uh, triple 10 for a second. What those numbers mean, uh, if you're buying triple 10, that if you bought 100 pounds of triple 10, there'd be 10 pounds of nitrogen, 10 pounds of phosphorus, and 10 pounds of potassium. If you bought a 50 pound bag of 10, 10, 10, you're actually getting 5, 5, 5. Okay, everything's based on a 100 pound weight. And so a 50-pound bag of triple 10 actually has five pounds of each of those three components on there. So if the soil lab report comes back and says, well, you need 10 pounds of nitrogen, okay, well, then you're going to have to buy 100 pounds of 10, 10, 10. If the report comes back, I need 10 pounds of nitrogen, 10 pounds of phosphorus, 10 pounds of potassium to, to meet 
that recommendation. So just so everyone understands how that's calculated, it's based on 100 pounds of fertilizer, and that's the actual amounts of each of those three components that you'll get. They don't know what you've got available to you, you know, when they make that recommendation. They're looking at the soil. They're looking at the crop. And so it's up to you to try to find a fertilizer that matches that. And I can tell you that on these legumes that we're going to inoculate, like cow peas, like soybeans, like lab lab, we're not going to use much, if any, nitrogen uh, because when we inoculate that seed, or in some cases it comes pre-inoculated, uh, but if when we inoculate that seed, what we're doing is we're providing bacteria that's going to fix uh, nitrogen from the air from those roots, and it's just like getting a little dose of nitrogen fertilizer every day. Uh, nitrogen fertilizer is not cheap, and so if you can plant legumes that fix nitrogen from the atmosphere by inoculating that seed at planting, you're cutting your cost, yet you're also helping those plants uh, get what they need by having that bacteria uh, included and incorporated in that soil to where they're able to get that nitrogen, and that's really going to be something that's going to boost production. So any legume that you plant, whether it's warm season, whether it's cool season, make sure that vendor that you're buying from can also provide you with that uh, variety specific, that plant specific inoculant. For example, an air leaf clover inoculant isn't going to work on cowpeas and vice versa. So you've got to be able to uh, determine, okay, is my seed pre inoculated? If not, I need the uh, specific inoculant for my plant. And please, whatever you do, don't throw that bag of inoculant up there on the dash of the pickup and ride around for two or three days with it in that direct sunlight. It needs to be kept in a cool place uh, until you inoculate that seed at planting. And how do you inoculate that seed, Billy, if you don't get a pre-inoculated seed? Well, typically you can uh, use, there, there's commercial uh, inoculants that spread that's, that, are, that are stickers that you can put on there to adhere the inoculant uh, to the seed. <clears throat> Some people will mix up a little sugar and water to do it. But really, you know, if, if your vendor has a sticker that they can spread to help the inoculant stick to the seed, that's going to be your best choice. It's messy. I know people don't like to do it because you've got to mix all that together. It's an extra step. But if you're planting a legume, it's well worth, if that seed doesn't come pre-inoculated, it's well worth going through that inoculation process because it really will boost production of that plant. It sounds like it may be just easier to go ahead and just get a pre-inoculated seed. And some of them are available pre-inoculated, but there's some that won't be, that you have to buy the inoculant separate and do it yourself. But they've got everything you need. If they're providing that seed, they should also have that inoculant and uh, the way to, to stick it on, on in-house there that they can sell you when you buy the seed. Okay, Billy. Um, you said in your paper, top 10 mistakes landowners and hunters make when establishing supplemental forages. You said the number two problem is seed rates. Can you explain why this is such an issue? Well, you know, I occasionally get calls from seed companies and they say, well, we mix this and this and this and this and this. What do you think? And my question is, uh, my answer is always the same. About what? I mean, you dump a bunch of seed of different varieties together in hopes that something's going to germinate and do well and attract the deer. You have to go through what I call uh, variety compa compatibility, and that is, let's go back to our example of, uh, say, oats and clover that we were talking about. But we could also talk about cow peas and joint veg or cow peas and Alice clover. If you seed at such a heavy rate with one variety that it outcompetes whatever else is out there with it for nutrients, for sunlight, for water, then you've got too much planted. On the other hand, if you decide that 100 pounds per acre is better than 50 pounds per acre, you can reach a point to where regardless of what your seeding rate is, you've maxed out at uh, what your yield's going to be at X, X number of 1,000 pounds per acre. In other words, you may get as good a production at 50 pounds of XYZ variety planted versus 75 or 100 pounds. And that's exactly the research that we did 
when we, we made the fall combination of cowpeas, oats, and airleaf clover, we varied the seeding rates of those varieties in such a way that we could look at the yields to see which would uh, was ideal to let each plant in that combination planting uh, do its best and produce the most forage that it could without competing with another variety in that mix. So that's something that I think for a lot of combination plantings by seed companies is not really being looked at, at uh, how, what happens when we get something that's got a high growth form uh, outcompete something in that mix that's got a low growth form and, and you know, you, you get one pulling and one pushing and it's not a good good strategy. And so doing that research on seeding rates uh, is very important uh, fortunately, uh, a lot of that's already been done, and the uh, and the hunting club or landowner doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, for example, we know that in most cases we can max our cowpea production at the rate of about 50 pounds to the acre. <clears throat> we know we can max our cereal grain production at about 100 pounds per acre. So a lot of the this research has already been done. So it's, it goes back to the old adage of, well, if a little bit good a lot's better, right? Well, typically wrong. And so following those seeding rates, if they've been established by scientific research, that's a good thing because it's going to save you money and keep you from over planting. But at the same time, it may keep you from uh, planting too little. I'll give you a perfect example of that. Uh, chicory. I love chicory. It's drought tolerant, but it's very expensive seed. And we looked at some, some various rates, planted it at five pounds to the acre, which was one of the recommendations on planting chicory. But we also doubled it in our planting with a cereal grain, oats, and doubled it to 10 pounds to the acre. Uh, quite honestly, that increases the cost of the plot quite a bit. But from what I saw at a five pound seeding rate, based on our research, that just wasn't going to produce enough forage to make it worthwhile to plant. Therefore, my recommendation, if you're going to plant a small grain and chicory in the fall together, is to go with a 10-pound rate because our production was much higher on the chicory side, uh, and, it, and still you had the cereal grain. So a lot of, a lot of these are, are established, so you don't have to guess. But uh, if the seeding rate says 50 pounds, it's not always better to plant 100 pounds because it, there may be diminishing returns there in terms of production versus the uh, extra cost of the seed that you're trying to plant. So fortunately, a lot of that's already worked out for the for the hunting club or the landowner. Yeah, and wherever you get your seed, they should have your seeding rates, correct? That they should have, and a lot of our publications that uh, you alluded to also have those seeding rates established in there and like i say it needs to be based on trial and error not just uh well let me throw a little bit of this in there and a lot of this in there and see what comes out uh by varying those seeding rates and see how the seeding rate of one plant affects the production of another plant until you make those different comparisons there's no way to really know and uh, that's what we've done with our combination so we know how much of each we need to establish to give good stance but we're we're not getting into diminishing returns in terms of uh, not producing enough of that plant based on competition with other plants in that mix. Yes, sir. Okay, so once you get your food pot established and it's going into that key stress time or just before it, you know, once it's going well, how best do you maintain it, you know, once it's established? The best way to maintain these warm season plots, and this is going to depend, again, on, on a couple of things, how large a deer population you've got, how many acres per deer, you know, you, you may be at a pretty high deer density, but also how good a shape your native habitat is. If you've got uh, a low deer density and really good habitat, the deer are not going to hammer those food plots nearly as hard as they will if you've got a high deer density and poor native habitat. They're going to rely on them much more. And so... Uh, the main thing we can do in the summer is to plant large enough plots to spread that browsing pressure out. <laughs> Unfortunately, some of it's going to be trial and error. If you go in in, the, in, the, in May of 2018 and plant two five-acre plots, and by the 10th of July, the deer have wiped both of them out, 
then you know that either you need to increase your plantings or plant that same acreage in one single plot to spread that browsing pressure out. Now, that's what I say. Based on our star experience, you know, if you can plant one larger plot, that's better than breaking that into into numerous small plots. And, and that's the main thing we can do to spread that browsing pressure out. But there is something else <laughs> that you can do. And... Uh, not sure I would have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, but you can actually go in and uh, uh, manage deer access to those plots with electric fencing. And you think, well, I don't want to get into all of that, but this is a four-wire electric fence. Uh, James Kroll down at SFA came up with it, but we also tested it at, at Overton extensively because a lot of people just don't have you know, that 10-acre opening or that 20-acre opening that they can plant, but they still want to plant. Well, if you can go in and protect those plots until they get well past that two-leaf stage, let's see, you know, a month and a half, two months after planting, and then then start letting the deer have access to them by moving that electric fence or turning it off or taking it down, then you can uh, have that one, that warm season forage but also be able to keep the deer off of it until such a time that that forage can, can maintain itself as long as you're getting a few rains along. But it's an interesting design, and I will forward that document to you. But the highest wire in that four-fence design, or excuse me, four-strand design, is 24 inches off the ground. Really? And uh, we are able to keep the, the deer off of those plots by putting in that configuration and I'll, I'll very briefly describe it to you but you put a you put an electric wire that's the tape you're familiar with the tape that's about oh three eighths of an inch maybe half inch in width you kind of you you use the uh tipo system at the corners and then you use the the plastic electric fence stays in between about every 20 feet but uh, you, you twist that so it'll flutter in the breeze, and uh, you put that in 18 inches off the ground, okay? Let's say we make a square out of that, and we're going to plant inside of it, or we've already planted probably. Then you move inside of that three feet, and you plant two electric fence wires, not the tape. You establish two of those, one 12 inches off the ground and one eight, uh, 24 inches off the ground. And then you move three feet inside of that and establish another tape just like the outside one, 18 inches off the ground, twisted so it'll flutter. So this whole configuration, six feet wide, the tallest wire is the is the top wire and the two-wire configuration in the center, 24 inches off the ground, and it plays with the deer's depth perception. They, they can't quite judge how to get in there. What we did is we planted a plot with, plant, with some of the cowpeas outside of the fence because we wanted them to get on the forge we wanted to try to get the deer to go through the fence and we had four cameras up around that one acre plot and i had one doe jump inside that plot during the entire summer and then jump right back out but they kept that forage mowed down and every two weeks we would move that electric fence and give them another 20 30 foot wide strip and they'd mow that down up until that wire they got to the, the electric fence and they'd stop and then we'd move it again. And so it is a very effective design that's portable, that's fairly inexpensive, that, that hunting clubs and landowners that just don't have large areas to plant, they can effectively hold those deer off until those plants can get established and then start allowing them to have some of it or all of it, however they want to do it. Uh, and uh, allow those deer to be able to use that forage and still get that, that maximum production, but controlling access to it in that way. That sounds like a great idea to keep the deer from literally mowing your your food plot down <laughs> well, to the ground, which I've seen so many times when people have tried to do warm season food it, plots. It's specifically effective in the fall, uh, and, and we can get into this planting outside the box where I, I wanted to try cowpeas. We've been talking about warm season plots, but I thought cowpeas might work great when planted in the fall up until we had our first freeze. And so by varying the seeding rates and doing the, the, the compatibility studies that we have talked about, we established that you can go in with 40 pounds of cowpeas, 40 pounds of winter hardy oats, and 10 pounds of early clover, 
planted in starting. We planted as late as the last week of or as early as the last week of August when we had good soil moisture. You got to pay attention to your soil moisture that time of year. But as soon as we got soil moisture in late August or in September, hopefully we have had to wait till October in a few cases. Establish those 40, 40, and 10 per acre. And uh, we were able to produce over 10,000 pounds of dry weight forage per acre with that combination. But what we would do is we'd put that four-strand electric fence configuration up and protect the cowpeas. The cowpeas will literally spring out of the ground uh, in that time of year, given you've got soil moisture. Uh, and so what you want to do is let them have a little bit of it and then move that fence a little bit and let them have a little bit more leading up to either the youth hunting season that starts in late September, early October, or bow season, first October. And you can have those deer trained on that plot. And by giving them just a little bit, by moving that fence, you can have those deer hooked on that combination. And then let's say they browse the cowpeas out. That's fine. You know, that's what they're there for in the fall. By then, the oats are coming on, and that's going to provide most of your forage during the winter hunting season. And then once the oats start falling out in about March, you're going to have the air leaf clover coming on and providing forage well after spring green up into early summer. And so that is a hunting plot situation using that four-strand electric fence that you can have your deer trained onto that uh, and be ready for early fall openers if you're if you're a bow hunter or if you're carrying youth out, which I hope everybody is, uh, to take advantage of those early youth hunting weekends that we get in late September. So that makes a great combination for that. Now, by mid-September, that May planting of warm season forage, typically lab lab or cow peas, in some cases soybeans, they're going to pretty much be be done. They're going to have their growth done. They're going to go to seed by roughly mid-September. Lab Lab can go a little later. That's one thing I like about it, but uh, it's quite a bit more expensive to plant Lab Lab than cow peas. And uh, when I planted cow peas and Lab Lab side by side, it's been my experience the deer are going to use the cow peas first. And so here again, that's why I say start with forage cow peas. Don't be afraid to experiment but compare everything against something that we know works. And then if something else works just as well or better, incorporate that into your planning strategy in future years. Sounds like a great plan, Billy. I appreciate you going into the outside the box. I read that art, uh, that article that you sent me, and it seems like a great uh, strategy, especially with the fact that that clover planted in the summer there, you know, will spring. And you know, the cow peas, the cow peas will, will be okay. They'll do fine. But until you get that first frost and you go out there the next day after you had that frost overnight and it looks like they melted into the ground. So in a fall planting, that cow pea is just there to get up early, attract and hold the deer until the oats can get going. And I keep going back to oats. <clears throat> Elvin rye works really well on our acid soils in East Texas. It's probably the cereal grain that works best on acid soils or can grow best at lower pHs. Now, there's a limit, but it, it can tolerate a little lower pH soil than oats and wheat. <clears throat> now, I want to make sure everybody understands we're talking about rye the cereal grain and not rye grass. Uh, we have done this multiple times through the, the last 30 years, planted plots of wheat, oats, rye, and rye grass side by side by side by side. And every time, whether it's a high de deer density or low deer density, they will go to those oats first. If you look at the oat, uh, it's got a little broader leaf. You know, deer don't eat a lot of grass, probably maybe 10% of their diet. They're just not a grass eater like, like cows are. Uh, but uh, this, the level of soluble carbohydrates in an oat plant seems to be a little higher than it does in some of the other cereal grains and certainly ryegrass. And so that's what we think is the attractiveness of oats to deer. It's got a little higher soluble carbohydrate content. Don't know that for sure, but you plant them side by side by side, they'll go to the oats first every time. Wheat and rye about equally second and ryegrass dead last. Now, if all you plant is ryegrass and that's all they've got, they'll eat it. But uh, I think oats are, are the best choice for that fall planting 
But you need to, especially as you get up in the northern part of East Texas, you need to plant a winter hardy oat. One of the uh, knocks against the old oats that, that were available in the 70s and uh, 80s and maybe still are available today was uh, they didn't have much winter hardiness. Now there's a number of winter hardy oat varieties out there. So we get some of the hardiness of, say, a, a wheat or rye, but we still have higher soluble carbohydrates that the deer prefer. And that's the reason I like that oat planting, whether it be with chicory or, or you know, with air leaf clover for that fall planting. And that's the reason we use it in that uh, planting outside the box combination with cow peas and air leaf clover. Seems like a great combination, especially with as much forage as it provides. And I know uh, I've hunted over oats many a time, and yeah, I've seen great results with them. A, surviving through the winter, and B, the fact that the deer really seem to get on them. Well, you know, the the problem is general gun season closes, what is it, that first Sunday in January, I guess. Now, a lot of people that are operating on their MLDPs don't have to worry about that. But, you know, we're just getting into our winter stress period when gun season closes. And a lot of people let those feeders run dry or they forget about their food plots. And I, if you're using corn feeders like a lot of people are as a, as a bait, and that's fine. It's a harvest aid in East Texas. No problem there. But keep those feeders full all the way through at least spring green up and maybe turn them up a little bit so they're feeding at a little heavier rate uh, because those deer can benefit from that energy source that, that corn provides. The other thing that you're going to see on your small grain plots like oats or, or rye or wheat is sometime around Christmas or New Year's, you're probably going to notice that those stands are getting a little yellow. And if that's the case, that's just, that's a sure sign that you've probably got a little bit of nitrogen deficiency there and you may want to go back in with say a couple hundred pounds of ammonia nitrate which is 3400 a couple hundred pounds per acre and top dress those small grain plots when they start showing yellow uh, not that deep green color that you prefer and keep those things actively growing and available because that uh, that you know just like this winter that we've gone through that january february uh time period we've had some pretty tough weather and uh we want to make sure that that we bring those uh deer through that uh winter stress period and you know the bucks have lost a lot of weight during the rut and they need to this time of year they need to regain and of course we're coming up on spring green up now but uh, uh keep those feeders full and also top dress those small grains uh, if they start showing a little yellow around the end of the year great advice Josh, would you like to go ahead and go ahead and get some of your member questions that you have for Billy? Yes, uh, uh, I know that we've uh, we're, we're coming up on time here, but one of the one of the big questions that I see a lot is uh, is one that uh, uh, James Cam uh, Kamiski had sent in, and he James says, uh, you know, hey, I'm what if I'm the only person on my leash that's uh, feeding protein and planting a few uh, small food plots throughout the year? Is he really going to make that big of a difference and, and help the overall deer herd, or is it worth his time to even, you know, go out there and, and, and put these food plots in? Well, if he's putting in winter food plots, I mean, obviously uh, they can be a harvest aid. Now, I'm a big advocate. You know, we talked about planting numerous small plots in the fall for, you know, sure they're a harvest aid, and let's face it, you know, a lot of East Texas, you can't see 50 yards through the brush. So you've got to be able to pull the deer out of cover. Uh, and especially if you're needing to remove X number of deer off that property a year, uh, say, antlerless deer or what have you. Yeah, I mean, that's a valid use of those plots. I also like to leave some winter plots unhunted, never hunted. And so those deer will have some place they can go and where they're not being pressured. So particularly fall plots, if he's the only person on the lease, that's putting in fall plots, and he's the only one hunting over those, I'd say he's giving himself an advantage. Uh, if he's the only one using corn feeders to feed that energy, I think you're going to have some use uh, of the, those feeders by those deer. And here again, you know, it's not always going to be during daylight hours, but uh, he's probably giving himself an advantage. Uh, in the summer, if if you're not planting enough uh it's questionable whether or not you're really able to do the deer herd a lot of good. That's the reason I said a minimum of 2% of the land base. Uh, a lot of people will plant 5% uh, 
uh, of their land base in warm season plots every year. I think the warm season plots, if you're planting sufficient levels of them, have a bigger impact on the herd. The cool season plots, I think, make your deer more huntable. Now, both of those are important. I mean, why are we trying to do all this? We're trying to do this so we can, you know, reap the benefits of our hard work and and hopefully harvesting better deer, more quality bucks than what we would if we didn't do anything. And so I, I definitely think he's helping himself just from a baiting or attracting standpoint. And a lot of people think baiting has a negative connotation. I disagree with the cover that a lot of us are having, uh, you know, hunt in, especially when you get into deep east Texas or even some of the country in the post oak. Uh, you've got to be able to pull those deer out of cover to be able to see them. And so I think particularly in the fall, uh, using food plots, using feeders from a baiting and getting deer to where you can see them, it's definitely worthwhile. Uh, whether if he's just putting in warm season pots and not putting in a very high percentage, yeah, he's providing something for the deer to eat, but we really need to get that percentage of the, of planting up if we're going to have an impact on the herd level. Great. That makes 100% sense. you you got to have enough forage out there to, to feed the whole entire herd. If not, they're just going to come in there and wipe it out, and then all you know, the work is for not. Something, and I know y'all got other questions, but something that some, often happens is somebody starts their food plot program, and five years in, uh, and, and that, that's not all they're doing. They're doing habitat management. They're doing all these other things, getting their deer numbers knocked back down to where they need to be to meet their management goals. And then five years in, they'll say, hey, the deer aren't using my food plots as much as they were when we started. And my answer is always the same, congratulations. You you want those deer to make a living off native habitat. You only want those food plots to be necessary for those deer during those two stress periods, late summer and late winter. So the better job you do at herd management, the better job you do at, the ha- at habitat management, the less reliance you're going to have on those food plots, and you're narrowing those windows down of when those deer really have to rely on those food plots to late summer, late winter. And that's where you want to be. That's that's the goal. Makes yes, sense. Sir. The next question comes from Ricky Swell. What's the best plant, the best mix to plant the next month to help carry the herd all the way through the fall? I think I know the biggest part of this answer. It's probably going to be the uh, iron and clay cow Yeah, pee. that's what I'd start with. And then, you know, as, as you want to plant something else that, to compare to it, go for it. Just don't plant 50 acres of something until you see how it does. Now, I can pretty much stand behind iron clay cow peas because we've planted them continually over the last 30 years and planted them uh, and done this, made comparisons. And I think that's, as I said, that's the gold standard for warm season planting in East Texas. So uh, I would go in at a rate of 50 pounds per acre, plant the largest plot you can plant. Uh, you know, 10 acres is better than uh, five acre plots. And if you can get that percentage up to where you're planting 2 to 5% of your land base in that warm season plot, uh, I think that's going to be a good starting point for you to kick off and start planting warm season forages and mix that into your strategy. Now, what's the, uh, what's, what's the maintenance like on the, uh, the cow forge, uh, or I'm sorry, forge cow peas? Uh, there are a lot of terms. Well, uh, I think we've established earlier that we don't have to, that we're not going to go in and we're not going to mow these cow peas, right? Uh, we're going to let right. them get up around around belt height. And so once you get them planted, you know, as long as you've got sufficient rainfall and uh, adequate moisture within the soil, these things are going to grow. And once you get them planted, you're you're done with them, right? Right, and they'll be able to compete. I mean, at that seeding rate, if the deer will stay off of them. They'll be able to shade out a lot of competing weeds, so they'll do well at that seeding rate. And then all you're looking at doing, and keep in mind, we're not going to plant them right on the specific site when we start prepping for our fall planting in August, early September. Maybe adjacent to it, but we don't want to plant the same exact ground because we don't want to you know, lose forage availability the last week or two of August, the first couple of weeks of September, because we got to prepare our cool season site. So that's, you know, adjacent to but not on top of each other. Then what you can do, you know, is uh, at some point shred those things down if you want to and then incorporate them back into the soil. And, again, you're building that organic matter. You're actually improving the quality of that soil for future year plantings. 
because, uh, you know, let's face it, a lot of this ground we plant for deer, there's never been a crop planted on it. So, uh, you know, yep. we're starting with some pretty raw conditions. And a lot of it's never been limed if you're in East Texas. A lot of it's never seen fertilizer. So, uh, you know, we, by amending that soil uh, under the right conditions, right moisture, and planting the right varieties at the proper seeding rates, we can really uh, make a difference in terms of forage production for those deer. Great advice. So my my last question, um, you know, Chad Sims, he, he had a thought. Uh, everybody, whenever you're talking about pH balance, everybody's always talking about lime. Um, are there any other ways that are, you know, maybe a little more economical or maybe may produce a little better results other than lime, such as, you know, wood ash or sulfur or other organic materials that we could find already out there in the forest? No, I don't think so. I, you know, we're, we're – uh, we live on acid soils in East Texas. I mean, as you know, we grow a lot of pine trees. They they love acid soil. Uh, again, the black land you start getting into uh, uh, a little more neutral pHs. And I will amend some of my recommendations. If someone wanted to plant outside the box and go with a <coughs> oak clover uh, cowpea uh, planting, I might look at using rose clover instead of airleaf clover. It does a little better at uh, moderate pH levels. Uh, you could use oats, you could use wheat, you know, for your cereal grain and, and a little more moderate pH. But, you know, cattlemen have been putting out lime on our pastures uh, for years. And so those sources of lime are out there. It's going to be the most readily available form of uh, material to neutralize that pH or get it a little closer to neutral, uh, we don't always need it to be at seven, but if it's down around five, five and a half, uh, you know, if we can get it to six, six and a half through liming, there's not many forages out there that are not going to benefit from that amendment. And you may not have to lime, but every three years or five years, you know, I would, I would at least soil test every couple of years. But, but as you incorporate that lime into that uh, that soil. Uh, it's not like it's, you, you're going to have to lime every every year. So it depends a lot on the site, but uh, liming is not going to be something that you're going to have to do to, to site prep like you are shredding, disking. Not something that's going to occur every year. Great point. That, uh, yeah, that concludes all the questions that I had. I have one last question that Tony Shelley asked, and you mentioned vetch earlier when you were uh, talking about things. He was just asking... What are the benefits of vetch in a spring-summer food plot? You know, one of my big disappointments when I did my initial research, and I had plots in the piney woods, and I looked at bottomland sites and upland sites on the Sun Hunting Club, and then over in the post oak savanna, I looked at bottomland and upland sites uh, in the post oak savanna. So, you know, that's the reason we were able to see key in on some of these differences of upland versus bottomland sites. But uh, one of my biggest disappointments was our vetch production. We can grow that stuff. We grew several thousand pounds to the acre. We sent forage samples to the to the soils labs, soil and forage labs. The quality was excellent. It was available. The only problem was is the deer didn't eat it. So that's what I say. There's those four criteria there, and one of those criteria is why plant something if the deer don't use it. Now, it's been my understanding that you get in other regions of the state and some of the vetches are more uh, highly utilized, but you can drive down our roadways in May and you'll see uh, vetch growing on the bar ditches, just big, big stands of it, you know, foot 15 inches high, doing great. But I just don't see deer use in East Texas of, of vetch. And so, you know... Good quality, grow a lot of it, but if the deer aren't eating it, what good does it do to plant it? And so I was disappointed. I thought, man, we've really hit on something here by, by planting vetch, but we had very, very little use of, uh, of vetch by deer. Well, that'd be a good reason not to plant it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, why, you know, why plant something that, that they don't like to eat? That's why, you know, never, ever hurts to try something, but just plant you some small plots and see for yourself. Uh, I wouldn't commit to anything uh, that I wasn't able to ground truth myself. Back 
in the early 90s, there was a clover that came out of Alabama called 30 off 6. And this was supposed to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, immediately a lot of people in East Texas bought it and planted it. And that first fall, they hunted over dirt. So be skeptical. You know, don't be afraid to try something, but uh, see for yourself. Like you even said, all, even all this that I've said in our conversation uh, for this podcast, you know, don't take it as gospel. See for yourself. But what we've tried to do is distill a lot of this information down to save people from making all the mistakes that we've made through the years. You know, I've, I've made the mistakes. That's why I'm trying to keep other people from making the mistakes like the. the Ten biggest mistakes that we make planting forages. That's the reason I put that document out there because I've done all those things, learned the hard way. So I'm trying to to save people from going through some of the same things that we've gone through. But you know, uh, if something new comes out, cut you out of area of a plot that you're planting in summer forages, and and you know maybe plant you a quarter acre of it or something just to see. But it's got to produce. It's got to be available when the deer need it. It's got to be good quality. And the deer have to like to eat it. It's got to meet those four criteria or you got the wrong forage. Great advice, Billy. Well, guys, I think we're just about here at time. Josh, do you have any final thoughts or anything you'd like to add to this? No, my hand hurts. I've never taken so many notes since I graduated college. <laughs> well, you know, one other thing about supplemental forage is compared to feeding out of a feeder, we, we, don't, have, uh, we don't have pigs using our warm season forages near as much as we have them using those little yellow kernels coming out of a deer feeder. So that's another advantage of, uh, of forages. You don't have quite as much uh, pig use. And, you know, let's face it, most of our deer habitat and our part of the world is also pig habitat. So uh, they're going to share the land. <laughs> so I think when we can, we can feed deer using forages, we just have to look at that. I know a lot of people feed out of a sack, but when you're in a 35-inch-plus rainfall belt, I think you really need to take a hard look at using forages, and uh, you should be at that level, 35 to 55 inches of rain that we enjoy here in our part of the state. Warm-season forages need, need to be a part of your strategy. Yes, sir, Dr. Billy. And do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, uh, but uh, if you want to go into more depth about cool season forages, uh, let's get back together. Uh, and if we, we, I've also got some strategies on if someone's going to supplement their deer herd uh, with corn or use it as a bait. There are some strategies out there where you can lessen the impact of wild pigs on that. And uh, most of our deer hunters realize at this point that uh, – uh, the deer, the, the the pigs, when we're trying to manage for deer or any other native wildlife, the pigs are a liability. So uh, we've passed the point of them being just an extra species we can hunt once deer season closes. I think they really, to some degree, impede us in uh, reaching our deer management goals. So we can talk more about that in a future. Yes, sir. Uh, we've all seen the pigs. <laughs> yep. Yes, sir. And we'll definitely have you on around the 1st of August, like you said, just before prime time to plant your fall food plot. And uh, I'd love to have you on to talk uh, pig management as well. Well, thank That'd you. That'd be great. But everybody pull those soil samples and let's get started with our warm season plots to plant in May. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Billy. Okay. Thank you so much.